Welcome. Uh, I'm William Butler, uh, Executive Director of the Contemporary Arts Center. And uh, before we start, I wanted to share that there are fire exits, right? I mean, fire exits uh, there. You can see the fire exit sign right there. And then this passage back in the back, there's another fire exit that way. And there's fire extinguishers next to the table there and right here, uh, just around this corner as well. So, so this should put you all at ease. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope we don't have to uh, employ into that. Thanks so much for attending this very special lecture. Uh, for the very first time, the Contemporary Arts Center and the Fine Arts Society are collaborating to organize one of their regular lectures at the Contemporary Arts Center. And I hope it's not the last. Yes? Hey, thanks to uh, Chris McKenzie of Illinois Women Artists Project and Secretary for the Fine Arts Society, and Ann Kenny Lynch, President of the Art Fine Arts Society, for their help in making this happen. In August 2019, I first learned about Phyllis Bramson as a curator of an exhibition entitled What Came After Figurative Painting in Chicago in 1978 to 1998. That was the title. Uh, it was displayed at the Elmhurst Art Museum. And later in that year, Paul Pranick of Rail University wrote an article for Community Word about the exhibit, and I was prompted again to consider the exhibit and Phyllis Bramson. So I was looking on the website and, uh, you know, uh, Elmhurst uh, Art Museum's website, and then looking at Phyllis Bramson's excellent website, which I recommend you go to see that. And there's lots of great content on there, and learned all about her. Um, after corresponding for a few weeks with Phyllis, I learned from Kristen McKenzie that the Fine Arts Society and the Illinois Women's Artists Project had scheduled Bramson for a lecture in 2020 at Bradley University, but it was unfortunately canceled. Do we know why? I don't know. So I'm not sure if we know the reason why. Um, anyway, they were hoping to reschedule it. So we began the process of trying to align the three schedules of Phyllis Bramson, the Fine Arts Society, and the Contemporary Arts Center. And I'm delighted that it all worked out. Uh, so the primary component for the Contemporary Art Center is that we would exhibit uh, the work of uh, Phyllis Bramson, and so that is on the third floor. So you can find that go in the elevator, press 3R in the elevator, or you can go up the stairwell as well, and you'll find it up there. And uh, so um, tonight, I also recommend uh, all of you to uh, share with all your friends and bring them back. Uh, from 6.30 to 8.30, there is a public reception. Phyllis will be on hand uh, in the gallery and as well as Travis Jansen, who is exhibiting in this room. Uh, so it'll be our typical reception and um, food and drink and jovality and all that will be here as well. So recommend that you come and join us for that. So uh, I would like to introduce to you Anne Kenny Lynch. Thank you. Thank you, William, and welcome to everyone here. I'm so glad you could come on a nice late summer afternoon. Sometimes this is the best time of the year here in central Illinois. So thanks for uh, breaking away from your gardens and your paintings and your projects and, and joining us today. Uh, Miss Phyllis, it's a treat to have you come down. Thank you for Margaret to help and make this all happen. And thank you again. This is our first ever three-way collaboration. So I think that's a wonderful way. And as your new president for the Fine Arts Society, I'm thrilled to be able to, to do this as a collective activity. It's quite a treat. Um, and I told William the other day, I won't make an introduction that's longer than Phyllis's talk. <laughs> so with that said, thank you again for joining us. We're looking forward to a wonderful season with the Fine Arts Society. If you haven't joined, there's brochures over here. Thank you, William, for placing that there. And uh, please join us starting in October down at the Riverfront Museum. And we will have some special treats for those of you who join us on the first exhibit talking about the Tiffany window restoration. So it's, it's beautiful and it's technical and there's treats that you can get to take home not to eat. So it's a non-fattening event. <laughs> that being said, thanks again to William. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen because she has been working on this project for two years. So she'll give you the deep background on our event today. Thank you again. Thank you. I do proudly serve on the board of the Fine Arts Society of Peoria, but I'm here today as director of the Illinois Women Artists Project, a research and documentation initiative started by the late Chani Lyons 
um, an author and avid art supporter for whom this lecture series is named. Um, and the project is now part of Bradley University's Department of Art and Design. As William said, uh, Phyllis was originally scheduled to lecture as part of the department's Visual Voices series on April 30th of 2020. You can imagine how pleased I was and am that he was interested in this kind of collaboration um, to be able to bring an artist here and still have our lecture um, in conjunction with the exhibition. And I also wanna be sure to thank Maggie Nelson who is with us today as Maggie, a um, longtime member of Fine Arts Society is the sponsor of this lecture series. Well, to the matter of hand, um, Phil Bramson is a prestigious Chicago artist, feminist, teacher, and exhibition organizer. She has been a deeply engaged citizen of her art community and touched a lot of creative lives over her distinguished careers. And I know I can say that several artists in the room today have felt her influence as well. Um, from 1985 to 2007, she taught drawing and painting at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And since 2007, has been advising graduate students in the drawing and painting department of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Ms. Bramson earned her BFA in drawing and painting from the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, an MA in painting from University of Wisconsin in her native Madison, and an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She worked briefly as a window designer for Marshall Field's flagship store in downtown Chicago. And that will have meaning for you when you see her work and hear about her career. She was co-founder in 1973 of the very important Artemisia Gallery, a cooperative that provided exhibition, meeting, and discussion space that was very much needed for women artists in Chicago. I'm gonna to have to set this down. Ms. Bramson's um, work is represented in dozens of private, um, private and public collections around the country and beyond, including our own very, very own Lakeview Museum of Arts and Sciences, now the Peoria Riverfront Museum. Her work has been exhibited in key exhibitions and surveys at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Smithsonian Institution, the Corcoran Gallery of Art, to name just a few, as well as our own Riverfront Museum and Lakeview Museum. She has had more than 40 solo shows at venues such as the New Museum in New York, uh, the Boulder Art Museum, the University of West Virginia Museum, um, the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago, the Uni uh, Chicago Cultural Center, and numerous commercial galleries. Um, the many prestigious awards and grants that she has received in recogni recognition of her originality, artistic growth, and the quality of her work include, but are not limited to, a Rockefeller Foundation grant, three National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships, a Senior Guggenheim Fellowship, the Anonymous Was a Woman Award, the Distinguished Alumni Award from the School of Art and Design at the University of Illinois, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Women's Caucus for Art, and she was named Distinguished Artist of the Year by the Union League of Chicago. Wonderful signs of her, of her contributions to the, the world of art. Um, as, um, as William mentioned, um, Ms. Bramson most recently curated what came after figurative painting in Chicago, 1978 to 1998 at the Wilmhurst, uh, Elmhurst Art Museum. Um, that exhibition and the accompanying catalog were meant to give work after the Harry Who and Imagism, a new perspective, and to also acknowledge post-Imagism. And again, I recommend the website for that exhibit. It is really phenomenal. Ms. Branson explores pleasure, sensuality, and joy in her artworks as respites from logic and reality. Her works contain social commentary, political analysis, and feminist critique. They are complex and layered, both in material and meaning. I really urge you to notice her bold use of colors and the varied use of found materials. We will learn today of the childhood influences behind her recurring references to 18th century European Rococo painting and porcelains, 
Japanese and Indian Mughal manuscripts, and some of you know that latter is my particular passion and interest, cartoon figures and kitsch, and famous artists such as Pablo Picasso, Jeff Koons, and Kara Walker. Uh, Ms. Bramson risks the uneasy line between caricature and revelation, between the delights of theatrical artifice and its stunning ability to sometimes appear more real than reality. The characters on her canvases live and love, reflect on life and love, and anticipate and seek life and love in its infinite variety as they navigate an often hostile world. With that said, I will turn it over to Ms. Phyllis Bramson. Please join me in welcoming her. I do want to thank everybody that brought me here, uh, William Butler, uh, Kristen, and Anne Kennedy Lynch. Um, it was very, very nice to be here. I'm going to kind of break down this talk into a few different things. So before I really show the work, I just want to before I just talk, I want to read um, my artist statement, which Kristen definitely touched on. The narratives of my painting remain incomplete, usually never really telling a coherent story, and thus the narratives resemble abstract tropes. They are used as a repository for feeling, which often collide and intermingle between the personal and at the same time the social. Paintings that wobble between private subjective values, social concerns and conceit, melancholy loss and cliche. I work with collaged and painted canvases that often feature female images, which blend fantastical elements of seduction with innocence, fairy tales and kitsch. <laughs> and eccentrically theatrical images that are psychological investigations of my world, presenting two realities that I feel are often out of sync, often dysfunctional. I have always done work that reflects my psychological state and a gut reaction to the world as I perceive it. Those are the most important things. I deal with ideas, I have about being an artist and how I relate to the world. My work has always been about disharmony, including the desire to also do the right thing, about the struggle to make things work as a painter. That's the way the world is. It functions and it doesn't function. I function and I don't function. In many ways, I'm a painter of foul. I march to my own drum, deal with my own deal. And to quote that famous philosopher Popeye, I am what I am. <laughs> now, you know, I can say this, I could be lecturing at an art school and then nobody's gonna know who Popeye is. <laughs> I knew that I could do it here. Um, so we can start with the first image. Um, one of the things that you're going to notice is I deal with a lot of oriental figures. And uh, lately, because of the sort of watchfulness of you're doing this wrong, you should be thinking this, or, you know, this, this is the vote, and it's, there's a lot of odd censorship going on. And so I've, I have felt that censorship because Obviously, I'm not Asian, but Orientalism is a um, it's an actual art historical world word, and uh, I um, I've asked um, recently I asked a, a curator who was um, she's from Palestine, and I I said to her, what do you think of the censorship that I'm getting? And she was quite clear that 
she didn't think that that was fair. Um, <clears throat> and the issue is this, it has nothing to do with more than anything else that when I was a child, when I lived at home, my parents collected Oriental stuff, Asian stuff. Uh, some of it uh, were figures that had no tops on, uh, paintings, um, some with paintings that I looked at and kind of was shocked because there wasn't there weren't any clothes on the um, on the particular figure. So um, I had <clears throat> large Asian uh, uh, wallpaper in the dining room. I looked at that every single day. It was very odd. I wish I had still had it. It was gray and maroon and it just covered the whole dining room walls. And so I've always felt when I teach uh, students that they need to pay attention to uh, their childhood and what did, what did you look at? What's the first imagery that made it, was important to you? And there's this artist comedian, Martin Mull. I don't know what's happened to him, but he went to RISD and a lot of his work started with Dick and Jane books because that's, you know, where he, his visual reference was at the beginning of his thinking about that. And then um, two other things. The one is uh, I did work in window display at uh, Marshall Fields. I was part of a team that uh, did the window decorations, which were I wish I had pictures of them, I'd show them to you. And then, and this is very revealing, my father was an auto parts wholesaler. So at Christmas time, he would get boxes and boxes from, you know, people that were trying to sell him stuff. And some of it was, again, pretty lascivious in my mind. I mean, you know, cups that you turn upside down, the clothes wouldn't be there, pens. And then exquisite greeting cards, I mean, exquisite with glitter. Uh, and that's why when I say that, it's sort of like, boom, you know, when you go upstairs and you look at the work. Um, and I would trade with my younger sister uh, and try to take advantage of her, you know. I really wanted the most beautiful cards. So that's kind of the background. Um, so we start with Henry Dogger who uh, is a very important uh, outsider artist, but actually, um, how, what time do I stop lecturing? A quarter to? Like okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's influenced a lot of artists, including myself. He, he was a tracer. Uh, and at a time when it was really difficult, he'd have to Get, he'd have these books, children's books, all sorts of books. And he would um, take a page or two to a drugstore <coughs> and they would uh, reproduce them. And then he would use them to trace figures. And I'm not sure how he probably used some kind of a transitor. I think it was called, whatever it was called to train when you transfer one. Thing, especially when you were typing, that was probably what he was using. You know, that, that was the time when you used a typewriter to make a duplication. And um, his work now sells for maybe 600,000 if it's double sided, because he would do things double sided. His books were like about this big. And when he died, uh, the owners of where he lived had lived for about 33 years. Um, they found these books, they didn't really know about them. And, uh, you know, the little girls had uh, penises and sometimes, and uh, I don't think anyone here has one of those, but um, it's, it's kind of thought by scholars that he used that for little girls to give them some kind of power uh, because he dealt with these Vivian girls who were fighting I don't remember who they were exactly fighting, but 
there was a lot of battles going on and he was very protective of them. And um, that's kind of the history of him. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy that uh, he's been recognized in so many ways. Next. And miniature, Indian miniature painting, which um, I'm, I, I've always loved. I love the patterning. I love the kind of real and not real. Um, I love the sentimentality. Uh, obviously, uh, some of it, like the Kuma, Kama Sutra, very, there's various images that are, you know, they're pretty randy in a way, but there's a, a sweetness to them. And, um, uh, especially um, this idea of um, Scheherazade, um, which I, I read a lot about in terms of her positioning in um, life and culture where there was a story being told and she was captive and she never wanted to finish the story because the king had killed so many women, already young, young women and her sister was gonna be next, and then she would probably be next. So she told these stories to the king that are similar to my kind of like thinking. And he eventually changed his way of thinking. Uh, so it was, it's kind of a healing uh, narrative that uh, mixes good and bad, and it's traveled through centuries. So there's all sorts of different mixtures of ways that the work is drawn and the thinking. Next. Here's Seymour Rosofsky. Uh, one of those people that is lost to Chicago history and never kind of made it out of Chicago because he died, I think maybe in his late 50s. Uh, and the timing was a little off. Uh, but you can see he's a wonderful artist. And he was the first person to give me um, an opportunity. And I've never forgotten that. You always need someone that's going to give you an opportunity. And he was the person that did that. Plus, I think you'll see, if you haven't seen the show yet, you'll see a definite relationship to my work. Next. He also dealt with uh, a certain kind of Chicagoism, and uh, which has to do with a certain small amount of surrealism. And, um, and he was very clever. I mean, I think this is a very smart piece. And actually, I think I, I could have told you it was done last year, and you wouldn't blink an eye because it still is very contemporary in its feeling. Next. Peter Saul, taken a lot of risks in his life. And um, he's kind of been adopted by Chicago as a Chicago artist, but he did show at a gallery, Alan Frumpton. So uh, he knew about Chicago and Chicago knew about him. And he, he was certainly familiar with the images at that time when he was a, you know, had this more relationship with Chicago. Frumpkin Gallery was no longer there. And so it's a wonderful discussion of better than de Kooning, but he did a lot of things with Reagan and Angela Davis and the Vietnam War. He's got some very, very difficult work, which um, when he had a show at the MCA, that work was nowhere to be seen. I don't know what would happen today. Next. Uh, another influence for me is Fragonard. Um, <clears throat> and again, the kind of um, semi lurid very sweet, somewhat innocent, somewhat decadent painting, which he's done a few uh, paintings with dogs. Okay, next. And then, of course, the, the swing, which is, again, just a, a very, very uh, lovely painting. Pretty, if you know anything about Fragonard, this is 
one of the more famous paintings that we get. Next. Um, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> um, just a picture of my studio, just to give you an idea of where I work. Next. I live in Chicago in a deep town. Um, now the show. Um, promiscuous joining um, one and maybe your show can show number two as well. Uh, I consider this a really, uh, I'm, not, I'm not always totally pleased with my work. I work very intuitively, get myself into a lot of hot, wa hot water. There is this idea of collage and I just cannot remove myself from collaging. So I've kind of given up, you know, sort of here to stay. And um, again, I think, uh, you know, this idea of it, the Asianness of the work is, again, I, I just, I can't exactly explain it except it's a house, it's a, a, a memory from my past. And, um, so I think I, I deal with a certain aspect of eroticism, but uh, it's, it's, it's rather gentle, you know? It just alludes to something, okay? Daisy Cupids. Um, I buy uh, found paintings, well, they're not really found paintings. I try to find some found paintings. But I go to warehouses and I buy existing paintings and I'll cut them up. And I've tried to make a point of not cutting up religious paintings. I try, I, I think I've done it once, but they have so many different kinds of paintings and they can go from very large to very small and it's the same painting. It's just unbelievable that they have people that can totally duplicate you know, three different sizes. So I don't think anybody recognizes that on the right hand side is a Rotero painting. And um, they actually say, they call them Rotero paintings, which I think is, you know, I think it'd be new quote. And um, I, I've used a fair amount of Rotero paintings. Um, so, like uh, the flowers. Uh, that started when um, I just, I think I just knew I had to change my work. And I went, to, actually there, there was a time that there was a, still a dime store in Chicago and they had these beautiful flower paintings. Uh, and uh, I bought as many as I could and they're, they're exquisite. And in a way, I, I have been sort of influenced by them and I have to kind of work against them at the same time. So up above is a Cupid uh, that, you know, I always touch them. I don't, I don't just cut them up and put them on. I, I always have to do something with them, but that actually is a found painting. And then a lot of the other is just, some of it's me, some of it's not. The angel, the little uh, angel wings are actually feathers from an Indian painting. So uh, it just, I just mix things up and it's kind of magical in a way. It's like, I'll be searching for something to happen. I look around and something will pop up and it's, you know, it's like, wow, that's really interesting that, uh, where did you come from you know, kind of thing? And I'm, I'm having a show here, and then I'm having another show at Western Illinois. And uh, I've looked at these paintings, next please. I've looked at these paintings, and a lot of them, I have no idea how I made them. It, it's just like, I did that. Um, so uh, much of what I'm gonna show you are actually uh, from fairy tales or fairy tale fables. And uh, so Little Miss Muffet, next. Uh, the Apprentice Geisha. 
uh, here, this is a painting where I'm thinking, how did this come about? Because um, there's just some moves there that I, I can't really explain. And again, I think it's one of my better paintings um, and the way it uh, sort of moves together is kind of shocking to me. Next. Fascinators. Um, I, this is kind of based on in, the England, you know, with all those strange hats that they often wear. Um, and, you know, there's a little Hello Kitty image up there. And um, again, sound paintings. And uh, I think that. Uh, there is some kind of irritability about them. Um, and this idea of illicit joining, you know, the, how one thing joins another, and I have no explanation for it, except that um, composing is so important to me, uh, but it's not the kind of composing where I'll do as a student and they'll say, well, I put this red over here because there's red over there. Uh, and I'll say, that's not a good enough reason. I said, you, you already know that. What, what are you doing in terms of composing that makes the work interesting because there's some kind of conflict or pressure or something like that. I think of composing as somewhat of an intellectual activity, I mean, and conceptual. And uh, again, it's just so ingrained in my brain that um, I just, you know, the yellow is just traveling along. Uh, and I, I, I understand intuitively that there has to be some kind of cohesion, even when there might be disharmony. So I just, that's the most important thing in my work is how do I compose? And because I do it intuitively, it doesn't always work out so well. I have to really battle to figure out what to do. I'm doing, a, a, you'll see it, one of them is upstairs, a series now, and it's getting me into such trouble. Um, I, you know, it's like, it's, it, it, I'm miserable in a way until I can kind of figure out what to do. And that could take me a very long time. And therefore, I know some of the artists in the room, sometimes the work just, it just pops up, it works. You don't have to work too hard at it. It's kind of magical, boom, it's done. It doesn't happen always that often. A lot of times it can be quite a struggle. Next. Um, this is actually a print. Um, which is upstairs. All this work is upstairs. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, it's a series, uh, it's a monoprint, but it has a series of things that happened as well. Uh, a lot of it that is collage. Uh, I, I, I like going to Indian uh, shops on Devon Avenue in Chicago where they often will have these little they'll have painted figures with sequins on them and then I cut you know I cut them up. So this is just a tiny part of a painting. I I go to thrift shops and so that beautiful uh, centerpiece is actually something that somebody would put a vase of flowers on and put it on the table. And I mean, I added maybe a couple things, but it had this opening in linen, and I was able to do like a transfer using transfer paper of that uh, image. And uh, I, I like this print a lot. So, okay. Insolent lovers. Uh, 
again, a, a tremendous amount of different things going on. And um, I, I think I do often project longing, something somewhat alive. Um, abstraction, which is certainly part of what I want to do because I'm not a I'm not a realistic painter, even though the figures sometimes allude to being um, realistic. And actually those two figures on the side are found, but then I added the bouquet and um, she she is mine. The uh, seat that she's sitting in is something I found from a book about decorative painting. So it is a Xerox, colored Xerox that I worked on. The floor is from a found painting. The cat is from a found painting. And then that piece that the cat is sitting on, when, Margaret, do you know who that is? And, yeah, this up here. And I, I, I use a lot of his work sometimes because he's got some interesting passages. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of collaging and there's a fair amount of painting at the same time. Next. This is sort of a companion and of course you recognize Picasso. And um, I found that that Picasso painting existed. Um, so she is mine. Uh, and then there's a lot of found painting going on, you know, cutting up an Indian painting. I had a, a curator one time say to me, your, your work makes me so dizzy because I can't figure out what you've done mm -hmm. and what you're using. And I, that, that, I, I mean, that's, that, that's what I want to happen. I, I don't want people to try to figure out what I did and what I didn't do. And um, I've been using a kind of a striping. Um, this is probably the start of it in a way. Um, and it's uh, gotten stronger. And these, again, to get the color that I want to get, I sometimes have to work on these for quite a while. And they kind of sit in the studio and then suddenly I'll say, that's just not right. And I'll, I'll correct it, you know, I'll make it more powerful or I'll do something to change it. So they, my work cooks for a long time. Next. And of course this piece is in the show and uh, I just, uh, like like Japanese painting in particular, the, and the changing of seasons, because I think that sometimes my paintings are about springtime or winter. I really like winter paintings, making them because in a way that reflects my own identity at this point. I'm sort of in a winter period and um, so uh, again, a little bit of romantic interplay at the same time. Next. This is the, one of the paintings I was talking about that I just started working on. They're on panels. They're 48 by 36. Uh, I start with a found image uh, from a book. Uh, I get it blown up and then I, I, it got, gets glued on this panel. Now you think, well, that's kind of an easy thing to do. I've only found one copy place that will do it. Everybody else says, we can't do this. We have copyright rules and you just can't do this. And it's so ridiculous because, I mean, it's not going to, that's what artists do. Like, I remember when I was in New York many years ago at a residency, that nobody ever said that to me. But there's something going on. <laughs> Most people have been sued 
So there's one place in Chicago that doesn't question, doesn't ask, they just do it. And I've been so grateful to them because again, this was from a, maybe an, an Indian miniature, uh, the, the figure of Rapunzel, again, was cut out from a, a large Indian painting. The figure next to her was a total adjustment on my part. The hands and the hair down below are mine. The uh, gold and red is from a found painting. And I mean, uh, just as some of them can be perfect, I'm more really interesting at this point in um, found paintings that are awkward and not, not very well done. And um, so I, lo I love the awkwardness of that upper area. And, um, and then fabric, you know, the roses are coming and, and the other are coming from a, a, a dress that I found uh, that, that was big so I could find uh, it had a lot of material. So uh, it's just a really, it's a very interesting way of sort of making things. Next. And the thing is, I was taught to be an abstract expressionist painter. I went to school in the 60s and in the Art Institute in the 70s. It wasn't a very interesting time to be going to school. It was rather boring. I, there was something just so off. Uh, I didn't. I didn't learn a lot, but I. I did from the University of Illinois in Champaign. I le learned the importance of working, uh, and that was very important. But I also got into a little bit of trouble because I failed French because it was right after my painting class, and I just could not go there. And I actually, I actually passed the test. But the woman said, you didn't come enough. And I, you know, and I couldn't really fault her for that. I would have done the same thing if I had been teaching me at that time. And um, the Art Institute, too, uh, you know, the time of Vietnam War and faculty was protesting and just, again, nothing. And I was also almost teaching full time. So I, I just, I should have been. Again, I should have been told either get here to your studio and make the work or you shouldn't be in school. That's what I tell students now. But nobody said that to me and I, I, mean, I can't blame them, it's still with me. It wasn't until I went to the School of the Art Institute next that um, I learned about how to talk, how to think, more is more conceptual, uh, how to disagree. Uh, it was a fascinating 22, 23 years of being there and teaching and, you know, having these very interesting conversations uh, while you critique uh, a student's work. Um, and uh, that's probably one of the more important things that happened to me in terms of my development. But also, they had hired me next. They had, this is another one of those uh, pieces. This one is not here, I guess, not in the show. Um, now, so now I'm going to show you what that I wasn't in the show. Um, uh oh, where was I? <laughs> where was I? Do you remember? What was I saying? Um, you were talking about uh, the other. Oh, okay. Um, well, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. But um, now I think schools are much, they're much more pulled together, you know, because uh, they, there's much more of a dialogue. Um, and, and the other thing is, oh, yes, when I was at uh, UIC, I was hired because I was figure painter and I was a woman. Uh, I was hired tenure, which, you know, I didn't really think much about that. But what I became is a big mouth. 
you can't get fired. And the faculty, uh, some of them were really quite shocked. And then I would take all the stuff that they were saying, and they were not that, they didn't really like painting all that much. And I would have painting students, I'd say, well, this is what they're talking about. And this is what it means visually, you know, because I always have to what it meant visually. And uh, so that became really interesting to me too, because it sort of forced me to be more invested in my own thinking and my own language and not really feeling that I had to be part of a group. Next. Here's another favorite of mine. Um, it just worked, it worked for me. You know, it, it, this was not a problem. It just kind of fell into place. Um, and uh, I, I, I love the idea of, I mean, I've been using Pinocchio a lot. Uh, sometimes he does, he is an either, you might say Asian dress or 18th, 17th century Rococo, because I mean, another reason that I've entered into the realm of Asianness is Rococo actually was very influenced by Chinese, not Japanese, but by Chinese imagery, Chinese decorative uh, notions. And so that kind of, again, there was this odd moment when I, I connected in a certain way. And I guess it's only recently that I've been explaining my childhood because I feel that, that that's my defense mechanism for why there's still this interest. And so again, in this one, all of the painting of her and Pinocchio and up above is me. Uh, the painting of above has a Xerox, that's the next is a found object, the next is a found object, the one on the bottom is a, 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 a kind of start with a Xerox, which I just paint, repainted, uh, some of the flowers. Uh, some found paintings and all those other flowers that look like eyes, they're from fabric. Next. So this one's kind of uh, unusual for me. It's, just, it's a different, it's a different way of, of thinking. And it's actually hard for me to do this. It's more simple. Uh, I think it is more conceptual. Um, I love I love the middle images nose. I, I do deal with also a clown figure a lot because that to me uh, represents folly. And you know the idea of love in a hostile world. Um, I've been um, I've been working with the, that thought for many, many years. Um, and now it just feels so prominent in terms of all that's going on. Next. Another Cinderella. Um, I think it's pretty funny actually. Um, and uh, there's some, there's a lot of, there's some found stuff, but most of it's not mine. And a drawing is an interest of mine, that's for sure. I use also a lot of spray paint. So uh, some at the bottom, it's like, <laughs> because I don't know, you know, maybe it's not gonna work out. So I just try to aim properly and <laughs> hope for the best. And also health wise, it's probably stupid. <laughs> okay, next. Here again, um, I can't help but uh, use a, a, a kind of dainty nudity. It was important to me that she didn't have clothes on and top. Um, I showed at a place called the Brutznik Center in uh, Michigan City, Indiana. 
very fine art center uh, sponsored by somebody who owns a lot of McDonald's, but they have a strong children's program. They will not, that this painting could not be in that show because it has breasts. And because I have a lot of stuff with breasts, uh, that eliminated a lot of stuff. What's their reasoning? They say that young boys who come, once they see the breasts, they can't look at anything else. So I, I don't know. <laughs> so one one painting, I think I have it here. I actually thought I'll, it doesn't matter. This one painting it didn't matter. I'll just I'll put clothes on. It's okay. Next. <laughs> Again, uh, an unusual painting for me, and this is why again, one of these paintings where I think, how did I do this? What, what, how, where did this come from? And uh, I, I do, you know, again, this is a painting that I really like. Next, here's the one where the little blue figure down below, I put a little outfit on, except there's, you know, it's a female, so it still does have breasts. So I don't really know what they did about that. But um, then I, this idea of these, uh, I've done a fair amount, not recently, of these sort of like rolling bunches of imagery, which um, again, has a lot of collage. You can see that they're clown figures. Um, some that I did, some that I didn't do. And then a lot, there have been times when I found paintings in these warehouses that are like those squares and they're just abstract. So, you know, that helped me kind of keep this more in a, a, a place of both abstraction and um, some kind of performative uh, situation happening and many, many different types of people that exist in the world. Next. Um, <laughs> the, the titles are really important to me because they do explain the work in terms of what is happening. And this is earlier work and it just seem, feels very different to me from the work that I'm doing now. Not intentional, it just is what's happened. And I think, sometimes I think some of this earlier work is actually stronger than the work that I'm doing now. Um, and I do love, love this piece a lot. <coughs> Next. Pastoral pleasures. Um, I was, when I was in a show at the Cultural Center, I think, I don't know if they put a warning up, <laughs> I'm not too sure. But I was there at a time when I was just going in, because I, I went there quite a bit, and the, I always had to check to make sure that all the lights were on and blah, blah, blah. And as I'm going in, a man goes in, <coughs> and he's got a family behind him, he says, stop, we're not seeing the show, it's inappropriate. So, uh, this was one of the first paintings that you saw when you came in. So, uh, you know, that's the, that's the way it is. And this is, um, <laughs> and I don't know why I did this. I, I have no idea. Uh, perhaps I was thinking of flattening out a little bit. Next. Here we have, in particular, Dowder or Dodger, different ways of thinking about the pronunciation. Those are Dodger-like faces and um, Dodger-like flowers and wind, a winged figure that is definitely me being influenced by Dodger. Next. Yeah, boy, these are Randy, aren't they? <laughs> And, as, and for a while, I was actually using animals as observers, you know, commentators. So there's, a, I mean, one of my favorites is that little 
little dog-like figure holding some lanterns um, as part of the vignette of these two figures. And, and then you have a teapot that's sort of an innuendo of sexuality. So there are times when I've, I've signaled something, you know, to mean something about a romantic love. Next. Reluctant bride. So here we have a winter scene. And again, I, I, I do love this painting. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's about winter, but one side is a little warmer. So the left side to me is a, a beautiful aspect of the painting where it's just so icy. And, you know, it's again about longing because uh, you just, you don't know if he's gonna make it or not. And, uh, and there too, like those black dots, that's, that those are important. They just, you know, they mimic the breasts are mimicked by his black dots on his chest with his eye. And then it's their eyes and uh, just that, that that's important to me, that repetition. Next. Here, here it's definitely sort of from the 18th century. And uh, I, I actually, uh, and, and all of that landscape that they're sitting on, that, that's all found, it's found painting. Um, I add, and you know, a lot of tongues, and there's tongues over there, it's kissing. Uh, I actually uh, find that uh, this, this notion of, uh, interplay. I mean, because again, the uh, lamb and the young fairy figure, you know, it, it, it has implications which uh, confuse people sometimes because they think that I'm voicing something that I'm really not because they're meant to be playful and silly and, and somewhat troubling because uh, I find people a little scary. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I even like people. <laughs> they, they just are so weird to me. I, I'm not kidding. So uh, I think that that has a lot to do with some of my use of the figure. It just, I think people are inexplicable and their bodies, everything about them. Next. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised at these. I really am because I haven't, I haven't looked at them for a while, and um, so I find her really interesting because she starts out as one thing and then she just becomes a shape, and then there's that beautiful Asian background, and you know, an investment on my part in terms of the field, and periodically I've had people that. I call them cutters so that they can cut very intricately. Uh, so oftentimes whoever is working for me at the time will influence what I do because if they can do something that I can't do, then they've given me something that I can use. Next. I don't think I have the, the um, collector's wife collection, which basically uh, she got from him. So it's part of a pair. And um, again, a little nod to, um, to what's the call with the, the little the throw of the water in the, the lawn silhouette? Yeah, the silhouette, but I mean a little a fairy tale about, does anybody know what that is? Yeah, Mary Piper Fairy. That's right, that's what it is. And um, again, uh, just such a, a mixture, but you know, that second part of, uh, about the silhouette, I was looking at this painting and I was thinking, why did I do that? 
I have no explanation except it gave me great pleasure to do it. It's definitely not abstraction except for the little figures. And then the figures above, uh, I have a collection in my studio of objects, some of which I've used on. I don't, I think I've got the pieces one the pieces. And, and I have objects at home. Objects mean sometimes more to me than paintings. And I get a lot of pleasure out of objects. My father, I said my parents collected stuff. And here again, I think it's a clue. My father was a, a collector of everything. I mean, first edition books, blah, blah, blah. He actually had stuff in uh, sections magazine that I discovered. And um, so I think that uh, those objects have something to do with what I looked at in the past and what means something to me now. Next. I love this painting too. I love the two pictures. Next. Oh, okay. Um, well, that's, oh, yeah. Uh, this is the last uh, painting that I did. Uh, and so it's different. You know, that's all I can say. I don't think it's any better. I don't think it's shown this great progress. I think it's just where I am at this time. Yeah. I, 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 Margaret and I have been kind of talking about this because, and, and I was introduced this way, and I'm a feminist. Um, I don't really think about myself that way, but then look at that. So, um, so I'm sort of like grappling with what that might mean and how much of it I should acknowledge in terms of my work and how it gets interpreted. Anyway, that's the lecture. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking us um, on a journey through how you think and showing us a way to look. Are there a few questions? Let's take one or two. Anne? Have you ever included a self-portrait in any of your work? Well, that might be one. <laughs> Actually, I mean, I think uh, some of the figures probably do look like me a bit. You know, they're dark hair. I mean, I haven't done it intentionally, but I think that when you are working with most people, I think when you look at their work and if they're doing some of the figure, it is going to have some resemblance to them. Uh, I, I've even found when I was teaching, a model could look one way and the person drawing it made it look like them. Could, could be a guy, you know, and but they're still putting their face on. They don't even know that they're doing it. They're not doing it intentionally. At what point in your process do you um, discover what the canvas is about and give it a title or add any intention? Oh, thank you. The question was at what the question was at what point in her process does she recognize what the canvas is about? And, and title and, 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 and the and title coming. The titles, I, I guess I should have talked about that. Titles are really important. Titles help me to get out the piece, not exactly what's gonna happen because that's too complicated. But I, I do have lists and lists of titles. And, and I don't know if I had that title exactly. Sometimes I'll combine things together. But yeah, the titling is, is it helps. But it's still, honestly, it's still a mystery how this work gets done. Uh, when people go upstairs to see your work, uh, there is in, in reproductions here, the glitter that you have upstairs, it uh, doesn't seem to show up here. No. And, and I have to thank William for that because um, I told him to follow the glitter when he lit, and he did a beautiful job of lighting the pieces. Yes, he did. Um, 
because I don't want the collaging to be really apparent. And it's not, you know, sometimes people will light it so that the collage, all the edges show and the glitter sits back. So yeah, there's no, there, there is no way of dealing with that. But all of these do have glitter yeah. again? Yeah, uh, this one, well, now I'm working with jewels. Uh, and so that one, that one, uh, maybe, I guess that's an older version. Because now I'm, I get these strips of jewels and uh, on a lot of them, I don't know if anything upstairs has that in it. It might, I can't remember. But yeah, Walmart. Um, that was a real sign. You know, I can just pull them off and you know do whatever I want with them. And I've been using them quite a bit. Again, sort of embarrassed about it because I don't. I think for somebody who's a purist, I'm, I'm in bad territory. And it's kitschy, and I and I didn't really speak about the fact that I I'm, I'm a strong believer in kitsch. Thank you. I want to. I want to remind everybody to, um, we have a little time now to view the exhibit. The Fine Arts Society Board is taking Ms. Bramson to dinner at about five o'clock, but there's still some time to go upstairs and see the exhibit and then come back at 6.30 to 8.30 for the reception. Thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for giving us this amazing opportunity, a way to spend the afternoon. I yeah, just added that uh, we're not going to close, so we're just, we're just open all the time. So just feel free to uh, you know, wander about uh, this exhibit as well as the one on the third floor. Have some cookies and stuff over there too. Uh, Phyllis, I have a question for you. You work in the studio. You work vertically. You place the bell on the table. Uh, I work vertically. Even just collages, acting? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I have so much stuff. <laughs> you know, things of this, things of that. It's really upsets me. But I know that most artist studios are a mess. Yeah. <laughs>